Now, how do we make the diagnosis? I've said that we define this disease uh, using clinical criteria of dissemination in time and space and excluding other re uh, causes. And over time, we've had various uh, criteria formulated to make the diagnosis. So the first criteria go back to the 1960s, uh, where we just needed two clinical events, um, and that was the so-called Schumacher criteria, and they were formulated to recruit people actually for a trial of ACTH, you know, steroid type therapy in treating relapses. Um, then the diagnosis evolved uh, in the sense we started using evoked potentials. Uh, so these are electrical tests to pick up slow conduction centrally, which is a marker of demyelination. And we, we started using cerebrospinal fluid, CSF, looking for the oligoclonal IgG response within this, in the fluid. And so Poser brought out his criteria in 1983 that included evoked potentials and CSF to help support the diagnosis. And that's where we get the terms clinically definite okay, and laboratory supported and multiple sclerosis. It came from the poser. And then the MRI really revolutionized this. So we started um, monitoring this disease using neuroimaging. Uh, and so the McDonald criteria came out, um, which allowed us to now diagnose the disease, at least the dissemination in time uh, and space using MRI. And there have been now four different renditions of the McDonald criteria. Each time the criteria are changed to bring the diagnosis earlier and earlier. And I think the reason for doing that is we now begin to treat this disease earlier and earlier. And by doing that, we are altering the natural history. The earlier you treat this disease, the better the outcomes. Um, at the moment, we can't diagnose this condition in the asymptomatic phase. Uh, you have to have a clinical event, come to the attention of, of a healthcare professional to have the disease. But I wouldn't be surprised in the future uh, we may extend the diagnosis of this disease into the, what I call the preclinical uh, phase of the disease. Prognosis. Well, the prognosis of MS used to be shocking. You know, everybody who developed the disease would end up with a poor outcome, or almost everybody. I mean, there's this group of people, disease called benign MS, um, but the benign MS is a moving target. It depends how you look for it. Uh, and when you do look for it, you, you don't find it. Uh, just to give you an example, we used to define benign MS as having the disease with very little disability at 15 years. And we know that if you interrogate those people with cog cognitive tests, for example, more than half of them have got cognitive impairment. Uh, and the reason is our disability scale is physical disability, not cognitive. So if you just use other uh, clinical tools, you'll find they don't have benign MS. But even saying that, if 30% of 15 years have benign MS, when we go out to 25, it drops to 15%. Go to 30, it drops to 5. When we go to 40 years, it drops to about 2.5%. So given sufficient time in the untreated population, the majority of people end up with uh, disabilities. Um, I think that's changing now with our disease modifying treatments and the effective management of this disease now. We are beginning to see another benign population emerge, but that's a treated benign population. These are people going decades with their disease under control, you know, being relatively normal. So I do think we are going to be able to uh, see a benign population, but that's in the treated population. Um, there are a lot of prognostic factors we look for when we see somebody. Uh, males do worse than females. The older you are, the worse you do when you present with the disease. People with high lesion burden on MRI scan, particularly those with lesions affecting the brain stem or cerebellum or spinal cord. People that really have brain atrophy at baseline, cognitive impairment at baseline, raised neurofilaments at baseline. So there are quite a large number of prognostic factors at the beginning of the disease that predict poor outcome. Now, whether those factors play out now in the disease-modifying therapy era, I don't think so. I think if somebody's got a poor prognostic profile and you put them on treatment and you control the disease, in other words, suppress activity, those prognostic factors are unlikely to be as relevant as they were in the past. So they, are, they probably help now to um, identify a, a group of patients with a more risky profile, and you may want to use um, more effective therapies to, to treat them, for example.